Okay, so um, so as I said before, this is the third webinar in our monthly series, yeah. um, and we're going to be talking about enterprise budgets um, with my good friend and mentor, Susan Shanian. Um, Susan is a retired sheep and goat um, specialist for University of Maryland Extension. Um, she joined the University of Maryland faculty in 1988 as a county extension agent. She received her bachelor's degree in animal science from Virginia Tech and a master's degree in animal science from Montana State, Montana State University. She um, had a 100% extension appointment and she conducted extension education um, programs for youth and adults in all aspects of small ruminants, including integrated parasite management. Um, from 2006 to 2016, Susan conducted the Western Maryland pasture-based meat goat performance test and did studies comparing carcass characteristics of pen fed and pasture reared goats. Um, she transitioned to sheep research in 2018 and her first study was a comparison of ram weather and short scrotum lambs. Her last project was a pasture supplementation project. Um, she's done a lot of international um, travel and international work, um, including travel to Belgium, Brazil, China, Egypt, Hungary, Kazakhstan, Moldova, Poland, Russia, South Africa, and a bunch of Caribbean islands. Um, she's the author of several web and social media pages pertaining to um, small ruminants, including the Maryland Small Ruminant page. Um, www.sheepandgoat.com. So if you have not been there before, please go um, and Sheep 101. And I'll also put that in the chat. She maintains a website for the American Consortium for Small Women Parasite Control. And she owns um, her owns a farm where she raises Catan sheep, goats, and meat rabbits um, in Western Maryland. So um, like we've done in the past, while... Um, while Susan is presenting, if any questions um, pop up, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll allow Susan to make her presentation. And then at the end, I'll ask her um, the questions in the chat. So I'll turn it over to you, Susan. And thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. I might add, you said I'd been to quite a few Caribbean countries, not nearly enough of them. <laughs> I'd like to go to many more and I love the, production in the Caribbean. So it's meat goats and hair sheep. And I just really love it down there, especially <laughs> fond of Jamaica. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so good evening, everybody. Um, I hope where you're at is, is like here in Maryland that we've cooled off a little bit. In fact, I think humidity was below 50% today. It was about 85 degrees. So really nice weather for, for me, nice weather for the, for the animals. These summers can be really hard. So I don't get to talk about the animals so much tonight. I'm going to talk about money, which is pretty, pretty important. So I'm going to be talking about enterprise budgets, and then I'm going to kind of go into them pretty deep. And then I want to end with kind of going through a budget and um, just kind of give you things to, to think about uh, in terms of uh, answering some of the questions that budgets can help us with. And I always want to start with the idea, if I'm talking about money, I always want to talk, ask everyone to ask themselves, why do you raise sheep and goats? You know, and, and, you know, besides some of the, some of the fun answers, like, you know, you, you can think of the fun answers, but really, why do you raise them? And, and we go everywhere. If you look at this slide, everywhere from what I call homesteading, where you simply want some food security. And I think this became even more important or, or more at the forefront of our minds uh, during COVID. Um, people were particularly getting into, for example, poultry, but, you know, small ruminants fit into that food security as well. Um, things like 4-H projects for your kids, um, a fun hobby. In all of those cases, I'm not saying money's not important, but it may be less important. And then we start looking at what are some of the financial reasons to raise sheep and goats. Probably number one, and, and a lot of these folks are hobbyists, is 
hey, you want to reduce your real estate taxes. You want your land to be to be taxed at an agricultural rate. And the rules for that vary. Uh, they vary by county. They they vary by state in terms of, of what the requirement that is. Um, some people are looking for tax write offs. You know, they want to put in a building. Uh, they want to, you know, they want to make some uh, capital expenditures or improvements. The only thing you got to keep in mind about a tax write-off is sooner or later, you have to make money. The IRS does not let you lose money indefinitely in agriculture. There are rules. So just keep that in mind. Some people just basically want to cover feed costs or, or cover their out-of-pocket costs. Uh, to truly make a profit with sheep and goats, you have to cover all of your costs. And we're going to talk about those. Uh, uh, when I put budgets together, mine are a little bit different that I often look up, look at it as what really question do I want to answer as a, as a part-time producer? Uh, and it would be the same as a full-time producer, but whatever money I spend to get into the sheep and goat business, I want to be able to pay it off. And I want to know how long it's going to take to pay it off. A lot of folks, of course, are looking at sheep and goats to provide a supplemental income, uh, or maybe if you're retired like me, a, a retirement income. And then, of course, we go all the way to making a living farming, um, where sheep and or goats could be part of that. Um, there are people who make a living completely, probably from sheep or goats, but probably not that many, you know, percentage wise. But those are all the reasons, and that does factor into what we're talking about tonight, this enterprise budgeting. So, so what is an enterprise budgeting? It's basically a document or a tool uh, that helps us plan. It lists all the income and expenses per unit of production. Uh, in the case of, of sheep and goats, that's usually per you or per doe. Or if you're uh, buying lambs and kids and, and, and growing them out, that would be per lamb or per kid. It usually covers a specific amount of time, usually a year. I'm trying to figure out how to make a really good budget for accelerated lambing, where you lamb, say, three times in two years. And then I'm thinking, well, maybe that unit would be two years instead of one. Enterprise budgets are useful when you're starting out. You know, you're thinking about raising sheep or goats. They're useful when you're thinking about expanding. Maybe you have a hobby and you want to turn it into a business. Maybe you have a business and you want to grow it. Uh, sometimes they're useful just to get a handle on your costs and your profitability. So you can use an enterprise budget to look forward to predict uh, an outcome, profitability or loss of your enterprise, or you can use it to look backward. And, and to look up at, at have you been making money on this particular enterprise. Enterprise budgets can help us identify strengths and weaknesses in our business, areas for improvement, and how much risk we can tolerate. You know, if I can make a profit, if, if I sell lambs for $2 a pound, can I still make a profit if I sell them for two ten a pound? Or I don't mean two ten dollars uh, the other direction, $1.75. So how much risk can I tolerate and still... Uh, make a profit. Okay, what are the questions that we're trying to answer with the budget? First, can I make money raising sheep or goats? And usually when I'm in a meeting uh, in person, I always ask you, you know, who's making money? <laughs> you know, and then see how many hands shoot up. Can, can you or, or, or did you this past year make money raising sheep or goats? How much money can you make, you know? We all know that anything in agriculture is not a get rich quick scheme, but how much money realistically can we make? How much does it cost to raise sheep and goats? Maybe profit's not my goal. Maybe I'm a homesteader. Maybe I want to do it for, for the 4-H kids. Maybe I just want a reason to get up in the morning. How much is going to cost me to, to keep you know six goats and a buck? Looking back at profitability, what is my break even? How much money do I need to get for a 70 pound kid to make money? Or flip it around. If, if, a, if a 70 pound kid is worth $2.50 a pound, how many of them do I need? What kind of kidding percentage do I need? Uh, 
a budget can help you determine the factors that affect profitability the most. And we're gonna talk about those. And again, what is the margin for success? How much change in uh, feed costs, how much change in market prices can you handle before you go from being in the black uh, and making a profit to being in the red and losing money? So those are the things that budgets can do. So what does an enterprise budget consist of? Number one, assumptions. We have to make certain assumptions when we're creating a budget. Then it's basically a listing of income or receipts and expenses, and there's different types of expenses. If we're getting in to an enterprise or maybe we're expanding it, then we might wanna have a budget for those uh, that investment, those capital purchases. And ultimately we wanna analyze these numbers. We want, again, to see if we can make a profit, uh, to see what our break even prices or productivity is. And uh, in the case of investment, what kind of return am I getting on my investment? You know, would it be better for me to put money in a CD than to raise sheep and goats? How much return am I getting on my labor? Because usually in budgets, we don't put our own labor. If you pay somebody to do something, you know, you pay a neighbor kid um, to help, then that usually goes into the budget, but our own labor doesn't tend to go into a budget. And so then we're asking ourselves, well, what am I getting for all that work I put in throughout the year? What is that return to my labor and my management? Okay. So I mentioned assumptions. So we have to assume certain things and we can tweak those numbers. We can change them and work with different numbers, but we got to start out with, a, 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 for example, in sheep and goats, so how many does, how many ewes are you going to have uh, in your enterprise? Um, how many males for that enterprise? What percent of them are going to die every year? That happens. A friend of mine likes to say, where we have livestock, we have dead stock. And um, the same thing doesn't happen every year, but we do have to account for the fact that some die. We have to account for the fact that we're not going to keep the same 20 ewes for, for eight years. Um, we're going to replace some of them. Again, some may die. Uh, some may not be good producers or may develop a disease such as mastitis. And sometimes, even if you, we don't need to get rid of them for a reason, sometimes we just do in order to make genetic improvement to save the next generation. Uh, we tend to replace the males more frequently because uh, you know after the first year, you then have daughters related to that male, but we have to put a figure in our budgets. We gotta, we gotta decide at what weight we're gonna market our animals. Um, and again, we can we can tweak and, and, and change those numbers as we do the budget. And we have to come up with a percent lamb and kid crop because that's our primary productivity, at least on the meat side. Obviously, there are differences with dairy and there are also differences with fiber and maybe even some other uses of sheep and goats. Got an asterisk there because... Um, I don't like to assume that one. I like to look at how profitability is affected when we change that number. Okay. The next thing on the budget is the income. Pretty straightforward. Any sheep or goats that you raise and you sell, that's usually the biggest source of income. Uh, we also, if you ever look at the Schedule F, it separates these out. If you were to go buy, you know, 20 lambs, and, and graze them or feed them and then sell them, uh, that would kind of be a different income category on the Schedule F. So animals that you purchase uh, for resale, now that would not be breeding stock, so that would be market animals. And then any uh, products that you sell, if you sell meat instead of live animals, if you sell uh, soap, you sell cheese, uh, you sell fleeces, uh, you sell products that you make from fiber. Um, increasingly, we're, uh, people are getting paid to graze. 
You know, in the case of goats, a lot of uh, targeted grazing to control unwanted vegetation. Sheep are being increasingly used to graze under solar panels. So that's becoming a, a much more important income source. Uh, what I mean by agritourism revenue, maybe, uh, you know, there's folks out there that do goat cuddling. Uh, they do goat yoga. You know, anything that's kind of a non-traditional use of these animals you know, a petting farm, anything that you charge for. Uh, biomedical, um, we, our biggest sheep farm in Maryland used to be one that sold blood. They would bleed the sheep every so often and they would market the blood. Um, so, you know, there's opportunities there and there's probably things that I'm not even thinking about that is possible to make money uh, with these animals. So that's our income. We have two types of costs. One is variable and one is fixed. So variable costs, uh, we also call them operating cash, out-of-pocket costs. These are basically our input costs. Uh, they go up and down as, as we change our production. If I have more animals, I have more feed. You know, whatever, whatever I change in productivity, it increases the cost. There are a few things that fall into both variable and fixed cost. For example, a tractor. The payments that you make on that tractor are a fixed cost, but the cost to operate that tractor is a variable cost. Breeding stock. If you raise the breeding stock, you raise your replacement females, the feed, the medicine, that's a variable cost. If you purchase breeding stock, for example, a ram or a buck, uh, that's actually a more of a, it's a fixed cost because you're going to depreciate that animal as a capital item. So what are some examples of variable costs? A whole list of them, and you can probably think of others. Um, you know, the primary ones I'm going to say are more towards the top, but you want to make sure you don't forget these. You know, a guardian animal is a cost of production. You know, record keeping, that's a cost of production. So, you know, while the main ones might be the ones at the top, feed, bedding, supplies, veterinary, uh, there's a lot of different costs. If you pay somebody to haul, uh, the cost that you pay the local sale barn, uh, the commissions, um, things like, you know, there's just a lot of different costs that, that can come into it. There's ones, obviously ones that are bigger than others, but one of the things I learned uh, in doing my taxes over the years, for years, I didn't put any utilities on my Schedule F, even though, you know, I've got electricity in the barn, I've got automatic waters, I've got automatic or electric fences. And so for years, I didn't even think about that, but now I include a percentage of that cost of my monthly bill, I include that as a farm cost. Feed costs are number one, the single largest cost associated with raising sheep and goats, probably up upward of 75% of your total cost. And so I wanna focus a little bit on feed costs because if you're considering uh, raising sheep and goats, you're considering expanding, this is what should direct a lot of that decision, what it costs you to feed them. So when I talk about feed costs, that's any, feed that you purchase. And that includes the cost of acquiring it and the cost of delivering it. Uh, that's not my feed bin, but I have two feed bins on my farm and they, they charge me a delivery cost. So that adds to the cost of the feed. Uh, so that could be hay, grain, minerals, supplements, anything you buy that goes inside of those animals needs to be accounted for. But any cost associated with your pasture, and I don't mean fencing or the guardian dog, but, but feed, you know, seed, uh, fertilizer, um, anything to do with managing that pasture. Same thing with hay making. If you make your own hay, you have costs associated with that. And I would actually argue that instead of using the cost of producing hay, I would use the cost, the, the value that you could say that sell that hay for. It's what I would call an opportunity cost. Any other type of feed stuff that you uh, grow for your sheep and goats, you need to include those costs as well. So lots of, lots of feed goes into these animals, regardless of what and how you feed them. So I think it's a good idea to do a feed budget when you're doing an enterprise budget. So looking at a feed budget per head and also for the whole enterprise. So you look at the number and type of livestock that you have, you're gonna cover a 12 month period. You need to figure out how much feed you need for different phases of production and how much you can produce, including pasture, and how much feed you need to purchase. You need to know all of these things in order to put together a decent budget. So let's talk about feeding mama. 
feeding the you or the doe. She is the productive unit. She is what that entire budget is based on. So everything is per you or per doe. And you can see in this slide, I've got her year, um, you know, kind of kind of laid out for the year. And keep in mind, this is for annual lambing or kidding, accelerated, which, which Virginia State does an accelerated lambing and kidding program, is going to be different than this one. That's why sometimes I think the best budget would actually be a two-year budget. So this, this draws out her productive year, and we have to figure out when we make a budget the, the pasture, hay, grain, and minerals that are going to go into this female that so she can produce us kids or lambs to sell, wool to sell, uh, milk uh, to process, that sort of thing. So what I did here is just an example of a grain budget, just looking at the grain portion of this female, of this ewe, again, annual lambing. So during the dry period, she's on pasture. She's not getting any grain. Uh, during the breeding period, I'm going to flush her. And so I'm, I, I'm saying a half a pound of corn for, for, for five weeks. So you can see that value. Uh, she's pregnant early to mid gestation. She's going to be on pasture, perhaps A, depending on um, when that, occurs uh, late gestation I'm going to feed her uh, some corn before during that last month and you can see that value and then during early lactation so eight weeks I'm going to feed her two pounds of grain I'm going to assume she's uh, taking care of two offspring our old rule of thumb was a pound of, of grain for each offspring and then late lactation, she's going to be on pasture. I'm going to be working on drying her off so there's no grain supplementation. Now, this might not be exactly how you're going to feed your um, ewes and does, but again, it, it, going through the thought process of what it takes to create that feed budget, to create that budget, you can see it's about $21 a year in grain for this you. So per head per year, $21. That's where I would need to do this then for... The other feedstuffs that go into her, which is hay and pasture or forage, they are more complicated. They are affected more by weather. Um, hay varies considerably in quality. Pasture varies in quality. Uh, we waste a lot more feed in terms of grazing and feeding forage. But we need to go through the same process. We it's 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 similar with hay because we're buying it. We can factor in some waste, but we can come up with some values. Pasture is a little bit more complicated, but we can estimate uh, dry matter production on pasture. We can look at what the animal needs to consume, and we can kind of uh, figure out how to do that as well. Okay, now I want to switch over to fixed costs. So those are the variable costs. Um, what most of us look at the most, but there are fixed costs. These are basically ownership costs or overhead. They stay the same and do not vary with production. That's my hoop house. Its cost was the same whether I have two sheep or, 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 or 200 sheep. It's going to be the same. And so usually we fixed costs tend to be prorated over a period of years. But in the long run, we do need uh, to pay for them. We do need to cover them or we're not going to be profitable. So what are some examples of some fixed costs? Well, economists have come up with what they call the dirty five. They can't spell because it wouldn't work anyhow if they spelled dirty right. So, so you can see what the acronyms, depreciation, interest, and that interest isn't on operating capital, because if you recall, I had interest under variable costs. That's a different interest. This is interest on debt. Uh, repairs, and some repairs will fall under variable costs, but when we're doing um, more significant repairs and improvements to capital assets, it falls under here. Uh, taxes and insurance. Um, one of the challenges in farm financial management is is allocating these fixed costs across different enterprises. Let's, let's say you had sheep and goats on your farm and you want to see which one's more profitable. What can be very difficult to accurately allocate them. Usually we just kind of do averages and that sort of thing. So depreciation is probably the most important uh, fixed asset, and it's basically the reduction in the value of an asset or the cost of using it. We don't write a, you know, I bought a tractor. I, I don't write a check or, or pay a bill every month for it 
in, unless I'm paying, I, I borrowed money and have to pay it back. So it's essentially a non-cash expense, but over time that tractor is going to become less useful and obsolete. And at some point it, it may no longer be a useful asset. And depreciation reduces the amount of our taxable income. And, um, and a lot of farms in tough times live on depreciation, but in the long run, you really have to cover the cost of depreciation. Again, cover the cost of using those assets. There's different types of uh, ways to depreciate things and different uh, items have different lengths of life. It's something that you obviously would need to work with an accountant on to make sure you do depreciation correctly in your taxes and also to make sure that you use depreciation to your best advantage. And obviously the bigger a farm gets, these tax issues become even more important. Okay, and so what things can be depreciated on your farm? Buildings can be, uh, you know, bins and, and feed storage, fencing, uh, machinery, equipment. Again, breeding stock, you decide that you're going to get into the sheep or goat business and you go out and buy 20 does or, or use that they are, you don't usually write them off as an expense, but you, you depreciate them. You buy lambs or kids to feed out and sell within a year. Those end up being income and variable expenses, but breeding stock is tend to depreciate office equipment. You can probably think up some other items. Uh, this is uh, from a dairy, you know, a commercial dairy. So that would be a de depreciable item. Okay. Switching over to what I call an investment budget or a capital budget. Can your sheep and goat enterprise pay off the investment? Look at that barn there. You think you could pay that off with 20 sheep? I don't think so. So what things you need to look at, obviously, if you're going to raise sheep and goats, is you're going to be acquiring, buying, breeding stock, you know, using those or rams and bucks. Uh, livestock guardians, they're usually not free, so they are an investment. Housing and shelter. Fencing is, is, is often the biggest investment with sheep and goats. We need really good fencing. You guys know that. Um, not just because goats are hard to contain, but mostly because we're concerned about predation and animals that can get through poor quality fences, machinery, equipment. Uh, how much are you going to spend on those? When you're putting your investment budget together, the cost of the use and those is quite variable. I always say you get what you pay for. By the same token, I I, I think that, um, you know, your number one concern in buying females is biosecurity, is making sure you buy healthy, sound females, and you should put more money into the male, um, particularly a male that has some proven genetic value, um, which is uh, pretty easy with, with hair sheep, but pretty difficult with meat goats to find animals that actually have have proven value. As I mentioned, fencing is one of the biggest investment costs. Um, can you make use of existing resources that are already on the farm? Um, that is a big part of raising sheep and goats, not only for uh, uh, small farms, but for large farms. Um, a lot of uh, chicken houses, hog houses, dairies can be converted uh, for sheep. Um, I remember when my, my parents first move to where I live. My, they bought a place that people raised horses and my dad just kind of tweaked everything and made it for sheep and goats. And then when he could no longer do sheep, he tweaked it for poultry. So he made that building work for him constantly. Your housing requirements are going to vary by your production system and when you decide to lamb or kid. And one of the big decisions that goes into um, making plans for a sheep or goat enterprise is, are you going to buy machinery? Are you going to make your own hay? Are you going to clean your own barn or are you going to have pay for someone to do that work for you? Uh, takes a lot of goats to pay for a tractor or at least an expensive tractor. Um, but that's an important thing. I, even large farms tend to be, tend to buy, tend to buy, be overcapitalized and tend to buy equipment that they'd probably be better off doing custom, having custom work done. Now, custom work doesn't always work. There's, there's a lot of a timeliness issue to it, but that is some of the things that need to go into your 
as you look at doing an enterprise budget, at least a detailed one. So here's some um, assistance for figuring out housing needs, uh, feeding and watering equipment needs. Uh, it's called the Sheep Housing and Equipment Handbook. Um, it should work. The, the data in there is equally applicable to goats. The only thing I'll say that might be different, but the same thing occurs with sheep, is sometimes I think horns can increase the need for space, um, both housing space and feeder space. But we also have horned sheep. But commercially, most sheep are polled, and commercially, most meat goats are horned. Of course, dairy goats tend to be polled. But these can provide some general guidelines. I'd say some minimum guidelines. You know, so if 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 the guidelines say you need thirty square feet for a ewe and her lambs, think think of that as a minimum. Um, my website, Sheep One Hundred Two Hundred One, uh, basically uh, discusses housing and and feed and water equipment, but pulls data from this handbook. So this is a really useful book for planning an enterprise, planning an enterprise, because because you you know. It, it has some basis to it and you really do need to know, you know, how, how much water do I need for this size flock? How much bunk space do I need as well? Um, particularly if you get bigger and particularly if you really want to be commercial scale. So this is a really good uh, resource. Um, and then uh, this is not so much relevant to if you don't have an enterprise that already exists. Um, because they don't want to do startups, but NRCS has cost share through their EQUIP program. Uh, the purpose of this program is to improve water quality. And so there's lots of things that, that qualify uh, under that. Uh, they want to encourage people to set up rotational grazing systems and therefore everything that goes into that, which is fencing, you know, watering systems. They even, they've even cost shared buildings, heavy use areas. Uh, riparian areas would be about fencing away from those, but lots of different practices that they will cost share. So certainly if you're planning an enterprise, expanding an enterprise, not only get uh, friendly with your local county extension office, but make sure you visit your county natural resource conservation service office, what we call NRCS, and ask about the EQUIP program. It varies by state, it varies by county, the, the funding is competitive, but I know plenty of sheep and goat farmers that have gotten cost share. So a good potential uh, source of finances or, or help assistance with uh, investment costs. Ultimately, we want to look at those numbers that we're putting into the budget and and make some predictions may you know we want to know can i make money raising sheep or goats or both or neither am i going to lose money how much am i going to lose um can i simply cover my variable costs my out of pocket costs um can i make a true profit which is to cover all my costs again i already mentioned the idea of uh, what for all the money I'm spending and all the work I'm doing, what kind of return am I getting for the land that I provide, the labor that I provide, and any other capital investments I provide? Again, what's my return on investment? I'm going to invest ten thousand dollars in this sheep and goat enterprise. You know, how long is it going to take me to pay it off? I break even again. What kind of prices do I need? What kind of productivity do I need? Sensitivity analysis. What kind of uh, price swings and production swings can I handle? Uh, I guess I got ahead of myself a bit. A, a break-even yield uh, assumes a certain price. So then what kind of yield do I need? This is very commonly done in crop budgets. You know, if 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 um you know if corn is five dollars a bushel, what yield do I need to make a profit? Well, yield in livestock in our case is percent lamb and kid crop. That's our that's our quote yield. And for dairy, it would be the amount of milk produced. Uh, fiber, it's hard to to be uh, uh, to to tell you because fiber is usually a a a second is a product along with with meat, so it's kind of hard to separate them. You know, we don't raise weathers anymore. Theoretically, you could, and then you could do a break even, and then of course a break even price is just the flip. It's looking at 
we're assuming a particular yield or productivity, well, what's the price I need to cover those costs? I mentioned the sensitivity analysis and really we're just trying to look at, you know, if I assume, uh, again, a, a certain costs, how is, if I change that uh, lambing percentage, if I change feed costs, if I change price, how that gonna affect my, my bottom line. And this particular table, I did a presentation on how to make money in sheep and goats. I do believe you can make money, I do. I'm not saying, it's not getting harder with, with some of the input costs, but I do think you can. And so I, I created a budget and just changed the percent lamb crop. And again, it could just as easily be kid crop. And um, the point, it doesn't really matter, you know, what figures I put in, in the budget, but just looking at how the percent lamb crop changed, changed profitability. Th that's the issue. You, the percent lamb crop, kid crop, it needs to be at a certain level to be profitable. In the old days, we used to say that you needed one lamb to cover the costs. I don't think so anymore. I think you need more than one lamb. And, and they said, well, the second lamb was profit. You're going to, generally speaking, you're going to have more profit as you increase that productivity. Now, that's not to say there aren't increased costs with increasing productivity. There is, but usually the per unit cost is lower. Now, you don't have to make a chart like this. You can just go back and forth trial and error with a spreadsheet on a, on a budget. What factors affect profitability the most in a sheep and goat enterprise? And these would be the ones you'd want to do a sensitivity analysis. Again, feed costs, 70, up to 75% of the cost of raising sheep and goats. And probably even higher if you're a more intensive operation that's using more purchase feedstuffs, again, the percent kid and lamb crop. I would argue that number two is the most important factor determining profitability is the percent lamb and kid crop. And obviously market prices uh, can have a, have a big impact as well. Um, those are the things that, that as we look at the budget, we're going to kind of monkey around with. Uh, how do you create an enterprise budget? Well, you can just sit down with a pen and pencil and a piece of paper. Uh, you can fill out an enterprise budget template. Uh, they're available from universities. A lot of universities have farm management kind of workbooks or business planning books. Any resource online that does business planning, uh, a lot of that stuff available. You can create it within software. You can create a budget within Quick and QuickBooks, those kinds of things. It's not that hard. We may not think of it that way, but we can do that. You can make your own spreadsheet. Uh, you can fill out university spreadsheets that are kind of already created. A lot of them have macros built in to try to make it easy. Uh, the budgets can be simple or they can be detailed and they're not all the same and they don't always have the same components. I mean, they always have income and expenses and profit, but they may vary in some other ways. Okay. Um, where can you find sample budgets? Well, there's a lot of budgets online, but the web addresses or the URLs are too long to put in this presentation. You know, these days, web addresses are much more complex than they used to be. Um, but if you do a simple Google or other search and just wrote sheep, goat enterprise budget or sheep enterprise budget or meat goat, you will find budgets. There's a few universities that have them. You'll find them. And, and again, they're different. And maybe you look at different ones and find the ones that you like. I'm going to use mine as an example. I develop budgets throughout my career. I will admit that they probably need updated now because I think I had the date of 2017 on them. The actual budget itself doesn't change, but the sample figures do. And, he, and while you shouldn't use those figures, people do. So I need to update them from that standpoint. But if you just go to my page, sheepandgoat.com, under resources, um, or that's the page. You can go to resources and hit spreadsheets. So you can just go dot com slash spreadsheets, scroll down, and you'll find budgets for both sheep and goats. And you'll find them um, some that focus on uh, just kind of straight commercials, some that focus on breeding stock, uh, fiber, and that sort of thing. I've always enjoyed putting budgets together, and um, hopefully in the future we'll have a little bit more time. Uh, where do you get the numbers to put in your budget? Not from the sample budgets. They could be outdated, like mine. 
um, I think I had $120 for a ton of hay and I can't get hay for anywhere near that price. <laughs> Maybe you can, I cannot. So not from the sample budgets, look at the structure and the things included, but you got to come up with your own figures. Uh, you can use past data. Uh, you need to look around for input costs. Um, again, suggest doing a feed budget so that your feed figures are accurate. And there are uh, price or market price data available from USDA historical data. You want to know what, what lambs or kids typically sell for around Easter time. You can do the research and find that information. There's even grass-fed um, data as well. There's, um, there's a lot of information out there through uh, USDA Ag Marketing Service. A couple of things about sheep and goat budgets uh, that I wanted to mention, and they especially do this out in the Midwest, but you may want to separate in a budget the ewe flock or doe herd from the enterprise of growing and finishing the lambs and kids. Now, if you sell them at weaning, obviously it's one budget, but if you do something with those lambs and kids after weaning, that's almost another budget. And so when the ewe or doe weans her babies, she's done her job and you can evaluate the profitability of that, okay? When you do something else with the lambs and kids after they're weaning, you know, you again, you graze them, you feed them, whatever you do, that's kind of almost a second budget. I don't separate them in mine, but I separate the feed out. And probably the next go around, I may start to separate them out more. Okay, same thing with adding value and direct marketing. I would separate that out. And, and my thought is raising sheep and goats, whether it's dairy, fiber, or meat, needs to stand on its own and be profitable. And when you add value and do some direct marketing, again, that's a new, that's another enterprise. Now, the way things are nowadays, it, it might not be possible to make a profit without adding value or doing some direct marketing. I get that, but I still want to look at it separately. Like if I was going to sell, if I was going to direct market meat from my lambs, I would charge the marketing part of my budget for that lamb. If that lamb's worth $200, then that's a cost of marketing that meat. I hope that makes sense. I would consider separating them. And sometimes, and you might find out that you you aren't profitably raising sheep and goats. You might find that out. But we also know at the same time that raising your own is part of the story that you're selling when you're marketing those value-added products. But think of them as two different enterprises. I don't have a direct marketing budget yet. That's one I'd like to create because... Um, I just would like to create it. A, a reality check, uh, a budget's only as good as the numbers you put in it. I can make you make a lot of profit on paper with sheep. I can make you lose a lot. Okay. Other thing, keep in mind, if you can't make money on paper, you're not going to make it in the real world. So just keep that in mind. It's as good as the numbers you put in it. Okay, now I want to go through a little sample budget, which with, with the one, I think, I, yeah, I got time. Um, and again, I don't want you to focus so much on the exact numbers, but focus on what are the things I included and maybe how did I get them? So the first, so there's the front page of my budget. It's, um, it has these seven sections. So I talked about these sections before, assumptions, income. I've divided my costs into feed, veterinary, and other. I didn't include fixed costs. Instead, I elected to go with looking at a capital investment and paying off that capital investment. And then the summary is kind of an analysis of all that data. Okay, the first thing is my assumption page. And this is the very most important page, in my opinion, because like I said, the profitability the biggest factor is the percent lamb and kid crop. And this would be identical for meat goats. Again, if I'm in the dairy business, it's, we're, we'd be looking at a different budget um, or different kind of budget because it would be less about uh, the percent crop and more about milk production. 
So for the so I start out with those things I already talked about. How many how many users do I have? How many ramps do I have? Death loss replacement rates. Okay, these are standard figures. They're ballpark figures. You know, replacing twenty percent of the flock per year that gives an you know an average of uh, five five years. She's in there. You know, Ram is replacing him every third year. I mean those are pretty standard. You can change them. You know, you say, well, I'm going to do it every other year, 50%. Um, you know, I'm going to replace use at 30% or, or, or less, you know, so those are very generic. Uh, sometimes they, the numbers come out uneven because the flock size is small percent lamb crop raised, raised. I, I, uh, that one, I don't, I, you can't put it in. You have to calculate it because I think it's important for people to understand what percent lamb and kid crop really is. So you put the ewes, does in with the male. They all don't catch, okay? So out of 50, I'm saying 98% of them lamb. So that's 49, okay? I'm saying in my case, they had 200% um, live lamb crop, live. So born alive, 200%. So multiply that, that's 98 lambs. Some of them are going to die between zero days and weaning, say six, zero to 60 days. I got 5%. So now I'm down to 93 lambs. Uh, some of them are going to die between weaning and market. Now, if you sell them at weaning, obviously you wouldn't have a figure in there. Uh, but if you take them from weaning to a market size, then that's 5%, okay, is what I'm using. So now I'm down to 88 lambs, okay? I've also factored in... Um, replacements. So I'm keeping back 10 U lamps for replacements. So I actually have 78 lamps to sell, but look at my percent lamb crop. I dropped 200%, but I've got 177% that I can raise and sell. So raise, sell, or keep as a replacement. And I can tell you for many farms, those death losses are much higher. So can imagine how much I'm going to reduce the size of that lamb crop to be able to sell. So this thing is really, really important to go through the different components of lambing and kid crop and see what it is. Because when people tell you, oh, I had a 200% lamb crop, did they really, did they factor in all of these things? Okay. Okay, so here's my income section in my spreadsheet, and this is like a template within that spreadsheet, it takes those numbers off of that percent, off of that, those assumptions, and makes these calculations, okay? So uh, here's, what, here's what I'm coming up with. So that's $377.17 per U. This is just a straight commercial budget taking the lambs, say, to the sale barn. So we've got lambs, I separated them by male and female, not that they're worth different amounts, but at the same age, the males are going to be heavier, okay? I've got cull ewes and cull rams. You notice the ram is not a whole ram because 33% of two rams is not going to be whole. So you're going to get some uneven numbers there. I didn't put anything for wool because I don't have wool. Um, and of course, unfortunately, it's fairly, fairly minuscule in terms of profit anymore. Uh, if you're a, a wool type producer, I have a different budget. Where you where I have it built in where you can sell individual fleeces and you know kind of change the dynamics of the budget. This is a straight kind of meat one. Okay, so that's the income. So the first thing I look at is feed costs. Uh, this is just for the U. And uh, I went through that feed budget like I saw you told you on that one slide. And so I came up with uh, these figures on a per U basis. And notice it's actually fifty two because there's fifty U's and two Rams. And uh, I came up with, uh, I put both a legume hay and a grass hay in there because I basically feed a mix, uh, a grain price, a protein supplement. I've got other places for different kinds of feed, but in this case, I'm, I'm not including them. I've got a place for minerals. I've got some pasture things. I've even got some protein tubs. And, and then you can always add more feed. But, but you got to think about what it is going to go into these use to make them produce or doze. And, and come up with the amount per head per year, do that feed budget on paper, and then create these numbers. So it's $129.32 to feed that you for a year. If you're more pasture-based, you're probably going to have less numbers at the top and more numbers at the bottom. And hopefully, maybe, 
a reduced cost of maintaining that U for the year. Okay, but now what are the costs on the baby side? Now, if you don't create feed and you're just on pasture, or you or you um, and you sell them at weaning, I mean you won't have this part of it. But uh, here I'm using the example where these lambs are creep fed from 10 to 60 days, how much creep they're eating. Uh, and then I'm finishing those lambs on feed. They're still getting forage. You can see I got a little bit of hay in there. And so it's costing per you $127. I've doubled my cost, but I fed two lambs basically. So it's about 60, what, $62, if I do my math wrong, uh, $63. $63 to feed a lamb, okay? And, and and this is the kind of thing that goes into those decisions. You know, do I sell lambs at weaning? Do I finish lambs? Do I graze lambs? What do I do? But if you remember that first budget, I'm selling 120 pound lambs for $2 a pound. So in order to, to meet that uh, goal, I've got to put some feed into them. Yours could look completely different. Um, but again, go into what it's going to take to get these lambs to market. So that's that part of the budget. The next part of the budget is health and veterinary costs. And I almost like to look at this just like the feed budget. What am I going to do to these animals in, 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 a, in a production year? So deworming, I used to put in there, well, I'm going to deworm the ewe once, you know, before she lambs. No, we do targeted selective treatment, only treating the ones that we're needing. So I'm saying I'm treating 20% of them. I'm saying I'm treating 30% of the lambs. I'm going to give a combination treatment, so more than one drug, so that's why the cost per unit, and I didn't calculate that today. I, it might actually be higher, but that's what those figures are for. Uh, other parasite control, that could be bioworma if you're feeding that. Of course, if you put bioworma in there, I guarantee the, I shouldn't say things, but it's going to substantially increase the cost of raising sheep and goats. Uh, I've got the clostridial vaccinations in there. They're fairly minimal in cost, but it helps you go through that thought process. Uh, you could have other vaccinations, uh, sore mouth, pneumonia, abortion. It's got room for that. Veterinary medicine, you know, you buy a bottle of penicillin, you buy a bottle of Nuflor, whatever you have, you know, you're going to have to spend money on treatments, even household treatments. Uh, I got this you that I've been taking care of her for about a month. She got sick while I was on vacation. And every day I give her kefir, which is which is probiotic. So that thing costs uh four dollars at the grocery store that that factor needs to go in there uh professional veterinary services what are you paying the vet i'm going to assume uh, uh, when i put something like five hundred dollars you got to have the vet out there once a year at least in order to have a veterinary client patient relationship and that's the only way you're going to be able to buy antibiotics so you need to factor that in there and maybe there's one other visit maybe you have an obstetrics issue maybe you have an issue where you need the vet out there uh so that's what that is so another 27 dollar per you cost for that and then this last one is just, what are some other expenses you might have? Well, we have supplies, uh, things like ear tags. Um, sometimes I have trouble thinking of anything more than ear tags. Maybe that $5 uh, is a little high. I've got hair sheep, so I didn't put a shearing cost in there. Uh, bedding, that's one of my costs that's getting substantially higher every year is bedding. Uh, we're going to need to replace a ram so we can actually include uh, his cost in there. Uh, hauling, if you can't do your own hauling, even if you can, uh, there's still a cost to it. Marketing, um, it costs me close to 10 bucks to sell a lamb at the local sale barn. You could reflect that in your cost on your, um, on the price, you know, on the, on the income part, or you can put it in here. Everyone's obligated to pay the check off. It's fairly minimal. The sale barn, uh, will take, will, will, uh, deduct part of it. Uh, but again, it's to help you go through that process. Uh, livestock guardians aren't free. Not only does it cost to, to buy them, but it, it, particularly in the case of a dog, you know, how much do you spend in feed and, and veterinary? Uh, last year, my dog, uh, guardian dog, one morning I went out to feed him and he had a face full of porcupine quills. I forgot what I paid to get those things out. Uh, but you can see there's another almost $59 per you in this uh, example budget. Uh, this is my investment budget. And again, you would think about, well, these are the things I need to raise sheep or goats. I need to buy them. So I need to buy the breeding animals. Maybe I'm going to buy one dog. Uh, maybe I've got to establish pasture. Uh, fencing is often a big cost. Uh, maybe I'm going to put in some type of housing. Maybe I can't take advantage of his existing housing, or maybe I'll put money into adapting that housing. Watering systems, uh, you know, automatic waters aren't free. 
Um, but maybe that again, this is an area where NRCS can come in handy. A handling system, two thousand dollars wouldn't buy a full system, but maybe it'll be what I need. You know, I've just got feeders, uh, feed storage, machinery, all that sort of thing. And um, so I've got an investment. Again, this is just an example, just an example. But there is a per unit cost uh, for that investment. And then this is just the summary. So with the figures that I put in, and again, the figures aren't important. It's, it's kind of the what it is. This is what it came out to. I made uh, in this with these assumptions and these figures and values, uh, $48 uh, per U. Actually, I think that's pretty good if you can do that. Expense the income ratio. We used to look a lot at that in farm financial management about so uh, in my income, I spent 80 cents for every dollar in income based on the investment. It's going to take me 25 years to pay it off. Um, rate of return on investment, 4%. I think I can get that in the CD. So, so if I look at this budget, you know, and I want to think of it realistically, a couple of things it's telling me. One, it's telling me I can't afford to make that investment. So, so I have to look at, you know, it, it, it helped me look at different things in, in order to... Um, you know, whether I'm going to get into sheep and goat raising and whether or not I'm going to um, expand. And obviously, if we did 20 U's or 10, thing numbers would be smaller and, and we may not put much investment into it. But this was just an example. And uh, that's it. I, I know I went through a lot of material and I just, um, I hope that just it gives you the idea of all the things that go into raising sheep and goats and all the things that you need to consider and that you, you need to sort of go through the process to see how much it costs to raise these animals, to see how much, you know, potentially you can make and to see if it can point out things where, you know, you just can't, I mean, I can tell you after so many years of being involved in stuff if you put certain things in there in your budget, you use certain input costs. I'm just going to tell you, there's no way you're going to make money. You know, I tell people, you can't just buy feed in bags that costs $15 for 50 pounds. You can't. You can do it, but you're not going to make money. You can't feed Bioroma year round. You're not going to make money. And so you have to, you know, you have to, to, to you know, look at different things and, and see, see where they all fit in. So questions. I see one in the chat. Everybody else? Um, Thank you, Susan. Oh, no, that was just telling that everybody to be muted. That was just me saying any, any questions. Um, so we're going to... Um, yeah, I have a question. Me. I apologize. Uh, one sec, I apologize for arriving late, but my question is, so my professor at Fort Valley State, um, Dr. Whitley, she mentions that sometimes because of the expense of hiring a vet, that she takes most of the veterinary task, I should say, in her own hands. Do you do that as well? Yes. You want, and, and, or again, you talk about things you just absolutely cannot do and make a profit. You got to do things yourself. You got to dock lambs, castrate, disbud, vaccinate. You, you, you've got to do those things yourself. But with that said, the veterinarian should.